Welcome to the North Metro Mayor Association's Legislative Candidate Forum. Thank you for joining us. My name is Jill Brown. I'm the moderator tonight, and I'm the Executive Director of the North Metro Mayors Association. The association was created in 1987 as a nonpartisan organization advocating for issues and opportunities that are important to the North Suburban region of the Twin Cities. I would like to thank the City of Brooklyn Park for hosting us tonight and for being a valued member of the association, along with the neighboring communities. Our goal in sponsoring tonight's Legislative Candidate Forum is to provide residents with an opportunity to learn about the candidates' ideas and positions on issues, and these are things that we believe are important to the future of our communities. We will pose four prepared questions. Responses will be in rotating order with a set time limit on the answers. I note that these limits are maximums and not minimums. We regret that we cannot cover all issues of interest tonight due to time constraints. Because of COVID health concerns, tonight's event is being held without a live audience. I'm pleased to introduce the candidates with us tonight for House District 36B, Melissa Hortman and Scott Simons. Thank you both for being here. Each candidate will now have two minutes for an introductory statement, and then we will get started with the questions. First is Scott. All right, well, thank you. Uh, thank you to the um, North Metro Mayors for hosting uh, and sponsoring this tonight. Um, just a little bit about my background and uh, uh, qualifications. Um, I'm a 25-year resident of Brooklyn Park, and uh, our family is invested here. We uh, raised a family, we built a house, we sent our kids to school, uh, and I've been an active member uh, of the community uh, in a volunteer capacity uh, for, over 20, for, for the last 25 years. Um, locally, I guess, I've stepped up on many occasions to serve the community, uh, both as a city council member, charter commission chair, uh, and other things like the budget advisory task force and being volunteer um, on many commissions and in the school district as well. And then also uh, uh, working for the Brooklyn Park Athletic Association uh, in the soccer program and on the Tater Day Steering Committee. And now professionally, um, I have a good uh, background for this opportunity. I, I think I can hit the ground running. My professional background is uh, in government. I've spent the bulk of my uh, adult career in St. Paul, actually, uh, working for the legislature, working for uh, uh, two uh, statewide elected uh, constitutional officers, uh, and in the governor's administration. So I know the legislature well. I know the like the back of my hand. Um, uh, I know how it operates. I know how it doesn't operate. And uh, a lot of the times it's not working for us. So I'm here to uh, probably uh, elicit some change in how we do things. And uh, that's why I stepped up. Thank you. Melissa. Well, good evening. And thank you to the North Metro Mayor's Association. And thank you to my opponent for appearing. Um, I think it's good for the voters to get a chance to see the two of us together during campaign season. You usually will see campaign literature from one person or another, but here you get both of us at the same time, so you can really do a compare and contrast. I also have lived in the community for over two decades. Uh, we happen to live down the street from each other. I moved on to Windsor Terrace in 1992 and have been in Brooklyn Park for 28 years. Uh, on the same street. It's a great place to have raised my daughter Sophia, my son Colin, uh, two different black lab mixes um, at different stages of the game. And through my time in the city of Brooklyn Park, I have dedicate, dedicated myself to community service uh, around my legal career. When my children were small, I was a parent volunteer at Monroe Elementary School on the parent teacher organization. I remember counting many readathon minutes with uh, other mommies and daddies. And then I worked on the Anoka Hennepin parent legislative team. And there I worked on an issue that was important to me since I was a senior in high school and I graduated from an Anoka Hennepin school, which is the disparity in funding for education between the North Metro districts and other districts in the state of Minnesota. Uh, moved on from being a parent legislative team volunteer and joined a couple of different city commissions, the uh, Budget Commission and the Brooklyn Park Human Relations Commission way back in the late 90s. And for the last 16 years have served in the Minnesota House of Representatives, most recently as the Speaker of the House, where it is my goal to foster bipartisan collaboration and results. Thank you. At this time, we'll go to our prepared questions. This will be done in a rotating order with a rebuttal opportunity. There is a two-minute time limit for each answer, 
and after each candidate has answered, there will be a rebuttal opportunity with a 45 second time limit. So here's the first question, and Melissa Hortman will answer first. What are the top one or two issues you hear about while campaigning? And if elected, what will you do to work in a collaborative way to address those issues? Well, I think there's remarkable consistency in issues that Minnesotans care about over time. What I hear about the most is healthcare, education, and economic security. And for me, a special passion has also been transportation, making sure that we have the roads and the bridges and the transit infrastructure that our communities need. When I talk to voters, they're concerned that health care has become unaffordable and that it's linked to their employment. And they're worried that if their employment is interrupted, they might lose their health care. So I think it's important that Minnesotans have affordable and accessible health care no matter what their employment situation is. The other thing I hear a lot about is education. Minnesotans have prided themselves on being a really top-notch state in terms of educational achievement. But I think for a while, we've been resting on our laurels. And it's time to reinvent the way we're doing education in Minnesota. We have unacceptable disparities in our education system in terms of outcomes. And we need to do a better job of closing the opportunity gap. Uh, the other thing that Minnesotans are very concerned about is economic security. One of my colleagues joked in a speech on the House floor, it's a good thing that there's a lot of jobs because so many families need more than one to make ends meet. And what families tell us is they would like economic security in their jobs. They would like to have jobs that pay a livable wage and that allow them to take time off if they are sick or if a member of their family is sick and then to keep that job. So part of the, what I'm working for at the state legislature is to ensure that all Minnesotans have a good paying job with paid family and medical leave. Thank you. Scott Simmons. Would you like me to rebut or do my statement? Oh, I'm sorry. Let me repeat the question. What are the top one or two issues you hear about while campaigning? And if elected, what will you do to work in a collaborative way to address those issues? Okay, sure. Uh, we'll start from the top then. There's, when I talk to uh, uh, people on the street, people that I don't knock doors to uh, while I'm campaigning, um, two issues. And you asked for two issues, and so here's the top two issues. Uh, COVID recovery. That's the most important thing. How do we get out of this uh, mess? Uh, financially and health-wise. Number two uh, is public safety. How do we protect our families and our children? Uh, people are scared from what's going on in the last six months. So those are the two issues. So on COVID recovery, uh, it's imperative that we revitalize and strengthen our local economy uh, by supporting families and small businesses that are trying to recover from the economic harms uh, that were done by COVID and the governor's aggressive uh, shutdown. Uh, to turn the economy around, we really need to get Minnesotans safely back to work. Uh, we, we are up, coming up against, the legislature is a, almost a $7 billion now. At the last debate, I think it was six, I read in the paper today, it's about seven or more, $7 billion deficit. Uh, so the legislature is going to have to make very difficult choices uh, and make prudent spending decisions. But the keys to recovery will be easing burdensome regulations and encouraging local control and protecting taxpayers from potentially job killing and devastating tax increases. That only moves us backwards. So going forwards, they're scared about being taxed more and more than they already are. Minnesota is already a high tax state. To get us out of this deficit, we can't increase taxes. Government needs to share in the sacrifices. Of course, the other important issue is protecting families. So fundamentally, the first and most important core issue of government is the safety and protection of its citizens, right? Uh, we need to preserve law and order, hold offenders accountable, and uh, accountable for their actions. People that I talk to want more protection, not less. And they're frightened by the uncertainty right now, and they're not knowing really what's going to happen next. Uh, let me just say I would never vote to defund our police. Um, and we need, to, we need to have their backs. And I, that's why I uh, get the support from the police. Thank you. And now an opportunity for a rebuttal starting with Melissa Hortman. Definitely COVID-19 and public safety are top issues on voters' minds. And here we are in 2020, probably the strangest year that any of us have lived through. And it's funny, in this forum, we took off our masks and there's a little time warp um, where, you know, when I think about what's important to Minnesota families, I think a little bit of outside of the COVID-19 time period. We have to be united in purpose together to defeat this virus, not as Minnesota Republicans and Minnesota Democrats, 
but as Minnesotans and as Americans. It's really the virus that is the problem, and we can argue about the different responses, but what we really need to do is eradicate this virus and have a good plan to recover. Everyone supports strong public safety. It's really important that we have public safety for everyone, no exceptions, and I was proud to work with the police on reform and accountability this summer. Thank you. Now we'll move to our second question. Excuse Mike, me, I'm sorry. Don't I get to rebut what? You absolutely get to rebut. <laughs> I apologize. Scott. Okay, so I'll just take this opportunity. A couple things. Um, there's a reason why I was endorsed by the police and my opponent isn't, is because I support the police and I find it repugnant uh, that, that protesters would go to the house of a, a, a police officer uh, and beat an effigy and, 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 and make uh, terroristic threats uh, in front of a home in Hugo. Um, they've had enough of that stuff, so they're supporting me and not my opponent. Um, on the issue of, of uh, unanimity and being united, well, unfortunately, the governor's decided he doesn't want to be united because he's excluding the legislature from dealing with the resolution to COVID. He's acing them out by all these executive orders. Um, thirdly, uh, and speaking of unemployment, um, I think it's unconscionable that this state doesn't allow unemployment to high school kids. Many of these kids are trying to support their families and they're prohibited from getting the COVID unemployment relief uh, by state edict, and that's unfortunate. Thank you. Question two. What should be the role of the Metropolitan Council in guiding policy development in the North Metro? And this one, Scott, you start. Okay, I think my mic is on. Okay, so. Um, the Met Council. So trying to solve the shortcomings of the Met Council in two minutes. These are the things that take legislative session after legislative session to debate, uh, but yet we've seen really no progress on, on solving some of these problems. Um, first, the issue is what kind of role do we even need? Um, there is an argument for a cohesive and comprehensive metro transportation strategy to make sure all the pieces fit together. It makes no sense to have every municipality have its own transit system, right? But on policy development, why on earth would we as a community want to subordinate our own local goals and values and decision-making authority to a regional unelected authority? That makes no sense. In Minnesota, we have this very large Met Council. Nationally, it's the least accountable national regional authority in the country. None of its members are elected. All are appointed by the governor that happens to be in power at the time. Okay, so what happens then, there's a lack of transparency and accountability in the process. There's no accountability to local city officials that we already elect and entrust to make local decisions that should reflect our own local priorities. That doesn't happen with our Met Council. What, what should change? I think it needs to do less. The scope of authority that the Metropolitan Council has, acquired either by law or by mission creep, uh, well exceeds all other regional entities across the country. Ours has the largest budget of any regional authority in the country. It also has the authority to tax. But remember, there's no representation. None of its members are elected. Our Met Council has the broadest scope and the most authority of all regional councils in the United States. And it doesn't just plan, it owns and operates most of the region's core infrastructure. The problem is Metro Council doesn't really guide development, rather it dictates to local communities and businesses what, and, and entrepreneurs what they should do. If you ever talk to a restaurant owner that wants to invest, the sewer connection charges are prohibitive. The only restaurants that can operate now in Brooklyn Park are the national, change that have, national chains that have deep pockets. You won't ever see any local restaurants opening again. Thank you. I'll repeat the question, Melissa. What should be the role of the Metropolitan Council in guiding policy development in the North Metro? Well, when I think about the Metropolitan Council, I don't think of it as a policy development entity. I think of it as a, an entity that manages those resources that cross city boundaries in the metropolitan area. We have a Metropolitan Council that has a very good track record of being an efficient and um, effective uh, provider of wastewater treatment infrastructure and transit and transportation infrastructure. As uh, Mr. Simmons has mentioned, it is really much more efficient to have regional planning when we look at transportation that crosses city and county boundaries. We need a planning entity that um, can, can look more broadly at the metropolitan area. 
In terms of um, its accountability to citizens, though, I would agree with my opponent. It really needs to have an elected component. Now, there's many different ways we could look at having an elected Met Council. If we were to have direct elections, those district sizes would be so large that it would favor people who had moneyed interests. And I don't think we want that on the Metropolitan Council. But I do think that the people who serve on the Metropolitan Council should be elected officials who are accountable to voters at the ballot box for the decisions that they make. And now an opportunity for rebuttal, starting with Scott Simmons. Uh, Speaker Hortman's correct. There's many models of operating regional entities. The problem is the legislature doesn't want to get off the dime to actually initiate something and make it happen. Um, she's correct. There should be some elected leadership on the council. Right now, there's none. But how do we do that? I think we need the leadership in the legislature to get off the dime and make it happen. This has been talked about for session after session after session, and nothing ever seems to happen because there's no political will to do it, and there's a, a pressure, resistance from whoever's sitting in the governor's chair uh, not to do it. So I think it's incumbent on the legislature to actually take the ball and run with it uh, and, and, uh, and make something happen. Um, you know, the Metro Council is just too large. It, it does all these things, and we haven't even begun to talk about how efficient or inefficient it is. Uh, they need to improve outcomes, and no one's really um, uh, putting the oversight on it right now to improve outcomes. Melissa Hortman. Yeah, just to, I think, a brief rebuttal. Really, the track record of uh, the Metropolitan Council is really very excellent in terms of providing the services that is supposed to provide to uh, the resident communities in an affordable and efficient way. So our Metropolitan Council is very effective at providing the services that it provides. In fact, Metropolitan Transit is one of the premier transit operators in the country and has often received awards for its effectiveness. We can always improve and we should always strive to improve, whether we're a public or a private, private entity, uh, to be more efficient, more accountable, and produce more results. Thank you. Question number three. And Melissa Hortman will start this one. The North Metro Mayors Association works as a regional advocate for funding transportation needs in the North Metro region. What is your vision for how the North Metro can continue to compete for limited state resources crucial to providing efficient movement of goods and people in the region? There's many different um, modes of transportation that the North Metro area needs. We need improvement in our roads and our bridges, but also our transit infrastructure. The Botano light rail line is a really important regional asset that will benefit this area. When we look at how wealth develops in communities, it is built around transportation infrastructure. And when you look in the Twin Cities, the sectors of the Twin Cities that got some of the best highway corridors first or are located nearest to the airport have corresponding property wealth. And so in the North Metro area, we need to make sure that we get the transportation investments that will ensure the kind of development that create property tax wealth in our region. Having property tax wealth means having a good mix of homes and businesses so that the tax burden is shared amongst different kinds of property. So I will continue to be committed to ensure that we develop the Botano light rail corridor from the city of Minneapolis to the Target campus as well as fighting to ensure that the North Metro uh, roads and bridges get the attention they need from the Minnesota Department of Transportation. Thank you. And I'll repeat the question. The North Metro Mayor's Association works as a regional advocate for funding transportation needs. What is your vision for how the North Metro can continue to compete for limited state resources crucial to providing efficient movement of goods and people in the region? Well, there's no doubt uh, that a comprehensive uh, transportation system is critical for local businesses to transport their goods and services, but also to get workers uh, to and from their places of employment. Um, that's as true statewide as it is right here in the North Metro. Uh, but so far as transportation dollars go, uh, road bridge transit funds are finite, right? The pie is only so large. How do you cut it up? Well, first of all, partnership with neighboring communities is to, uh, to create a local consensus and pre present a united front is crucial. Uh, this debacle over municipal consent and the whole 252 project uh, was, was uh, unfortunate, and I think it, it uh, unnecessarily delayed what needed to be done many years ago. Um, you know, the accidents and the, and the rate of uh, daily trips is so high that this project should have been done a long time ago. 
I can only hope that this project on 252 doesn't languish like 610 did, which has probably set a record for the longest transportation project in the state of Minnesota. So the North Metro region uh, needs strong advocacy at the legislature. That's where you come in, North Metro mayors, uh, and with the Met Council and MnDOT to prioritize the projects that benefit our particular region. Uh, we've been slighted in the past uh, by the South Metro, partly due to the airport and the successful uh, business uh, strip through 494. Uh, but now Brooklyn Park luckily is catching up and business growth uh, along with housing growth north of 610 all the way up to Champlin uh, and the many new businesses along 610 present an opportunity which did not exist before. The South Metro clearly had an advantage. Uh, but now we no longer have to play second fiddle uh, to the fully developed South Metro. Cities like Edina and Bloomington are, have had their successes. Now it's our turn. We need to advocate through a lens of regional significance to get what should be our rightful piece of the pie and the transportation dollars that uh, uh, should come this way. Thanks. And now an opportunity for rebuttal, starting with Melissa Hortman. Two of my proudest achievements as a legislator are uh, the achievement of uh, the completion of 610 and the North Star um, commuter rail. In 2008, after the bridge had collapsed and it was clear we needed to invest in our transportation infrastructure, we unfortunately had a governor at the time who was unwilling to make the investments that were needed. So the legislature had to provide the leadership and we had to override a veto of that governor. That bill provided the resources we needed to finish the engineering for Highway 610. It was then eligible for the economic stimulus dollars provided by the Obama administration in 2009 to help us recover from the recession. Without the override, without the engineering, without being shovel ready, 610 wouldn't have been completed as it was. So I feel especially proud of being a critical part of that override in 2008. Thank you. And then Scott Simmons. Well, we all know that 610 took the longest. I think it is the longest project in state history from conception to completion, um, years and years and years. And I just hope projects, now, now that we have some, some leverage uh, and some uh, local growth uh, that didn't exist in the past, I think we can use that uh, uh, you know, as tools uh, to improve our status where we didn't have it before. You know, the 494 strip uh, was long developed and uh, now we're, I think we can be a regional uh, force where we didn't, couldn't used to be before. And we didn't have a North Metro mayors before, right? We didn't have any advocacy group that helped us, but now we do, right? So uh, I'm gonna put some of this on your shoulders and the people that normally sit at these chairs, the city council, uh, to work together to get things done. Thank you. Our final question, and uh, Scott, you'll be starting this time. Your community is part of not just a regional or national marketplace, but a global one that competes for business and talent on a global level. What policies would you support to help retain and attract businesses and talent to the region? Well, to start with something uh, interestingly that uh, Senator Amy Klobuchar said yesterday, which is competition is a driving force of our economy. She's right, and that's what made America prosper and is the economic engine uh, for the world. Unfortunately, our fiercest competitor is China, and we must never allow to China again to take advantage of us like they have in the past. So there's globally, we have to be vigilant and get tough on our economic adversaries. Uh, but here at home, unfortunately, what we saw in the last six months was, was cruel and unkind to business. Um, there was arbitrary closings of business and restaurants, while at the same time the Targets and Costco's and the Walmarts and other big national companies were allowed to take advantage of consumers uh, during the pandemic. Uh, to, and then to the end of that, we see lost livelihoods and lost dreams. So unfortunately, um, uh, that needs to stop. Now, apart from opening up the economy and ending state shutdowns, the best thing we can do if elected is stand firm against job-killing tax increases. Again, it's not only taxes. Another uh, tool to stimulate COVID recovery and retain businesses is an easing of our burdensome regulatory uh, government regulations. All the state agencies under Governor Walsh should be working overtime right now to make the regulatory climate more and not less hospitable uh, to business. We need to pi stop piling on these new and expensive mandates on businesses and even on local government. Mandates cost taxpayers and, as well as customers. Businesses pass on costs as well as governments do. We need to stop the unfunded mandates. 
these burdensome and inflexible mandates make it much more difficult for employers to do business here in, in our community. They put jobs at risk because we are at competitive disadvantage with neighboring states. It doesn't matter if it's manufacturing, retail, farming, you name it. Uh, a more government and anti-employer anti -employer approach is not a recipe for growth and is certainly not for business retention. Thank you. I'll repeat the question. Your community is part of not just a regional or national marketplace, but a global one that competes for business and talent on a global level. What policies would you support to help retain and attract businesses and talent to the region? You know, there are so many things that are important to attracting and retaining businesses. The first thing that comes to mind because it gave um, rise to the growth in Minnesota's Fortune 500 companies is the extraordinary resource of a, a fantastic education system and a strong research institution. The University of Minnesota has helped us uh, develop and uh, maintain uh, 3M and General Mills and outstanding corporations like that in Minnesota's community. But other things that people look for are related to quality of life. I, I'll never forget going up uh, to the Brainerd Lakes area with Governor Walls last spring and at a round table with business people, I think pretty much every person in the room was a Republican, including the senator from that area and the state representative from that area. And we asked, what can we do to stimulate business growth in your area? And they said, really, it's amenities. Things like bike trails, those are the kinds of things that make people want to live here. And the other thing they said was childcare. People really need affordable childcare. Um, and as I, I was about to yawn uh, before I answered this question, and that's because we had a bit of a late night at the Minnesota House of Representatives last night, and it occurred to me while I was starting to yawn, that is exactly those investments that we made in that bonding bill that are the kinds of things that attract and retain businesses in the state of Minnesota. Investments in our transportation infrastructure, investments in our wastewater infrastructure, our parks, um, and the higher education institutions, uh, making sure that we have up-to-date uh, laboratories and, and that we're taking care of that Im those important assets that already exist at our state's higher education system. So all of those components go together to create a place where people want to uh, live and to stay. It's not the snow. Um, for me, it's the snow, but for most people, it's not the snow. And now an opportunity for rebuttal, starting with Scott Simmons. Why is here? I would just reiterate, if the question is about retaining and attracting, I think the business climate has to be improved. Amenities are nice, but uh, if, if it's not affordable at the margin for companies to actually pl plant uh, their, their, their companies here and, and, and get employees and afford to pay them, um, then they're just not going to do it. Uh, once they have that, sure, it's ni the nice things to have are amenities. I, I don't disagree with that. Um, but we have to be careful when we say investments, because investments are expenditures. Right? They have to come from somewhere. Somebody's got to pay the bills. The bonding bill that was passed last night by the House is enormous. And I, I'm very concerned with a $7 billion deficit, how are we going to pay the debt service on that from years to come? Uh, that's going to be a very difficult challenge for next year's legislature to figure out how to, how to pay the bill. Uh, and uh, States like, like people can't have a credit card, an open credit card. And then Melissa Hortman. States, um, like people, though, do have to invest in infrastructure and the way that they do that, like their homes. And the way that they do that is they borrow and they pay over a longer term basis when the asset is expected to last over time. When you look at construction cost inflation these days compared to the cost of borrowing, there is no better time for the state to invest in, in construction. First, we need the job con uh, creation, but also the cost of borrowing is as low as it's ever been. I do agree with my opponent that we need to make sure that businesses have streamlined uh, permitting and regulatory environments. I've spent uh, about four years of my legislative career working closely with the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce on uh, regulatory streamlining to make sure that when businesses apply for permits, they get a yes or a no as fast as is possible. Thank you. That completes our, our prepared questions, and we'll move to your final statements. We are requesting 60 seconds max per candidate. And Melissa Hortman, you begin. Well, we have already talked about really the bread and butter economic issues of healthcare education and economic security. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, another issue that's very important to me, and that is climate change. We have really seen over the last 20 years an incredible acceleration in the changing of the climate. 
Climate change presents an incredible opportunity for us to create clean energy jobs and to also prevent damage to our economy going into the future. We need walleyes in our lakes. We need the, the grains that we grow uh, in our farm fields. And so it's to all of our advantage to create clean energy jobs and to take aggressive action to combat climate change. So if uh, I earn your vote this fall, uh, I will be pleased to return to the state capitol, focusing my time and energy on health care, education, economic security, and also working across party lines to get things done. Well, thank you, and thanks for the opportunity. Um, no one in Minnesota is against clean water, and no one here is against clean air, but we have to do it in an environment uh, that allows people to thrive and prosper. Uh, and, and to do that, we need to make sure that the regulations aren't onerous so that people can't uh, invest in businesses and grow their families and make life affordable. So we have to temper the, the desire to do all these expenditures and be big government uh, with the idea that uh, people need to live their lives uh, free of excessive government intervention. Um, I'm here to do that. That's why I'm running. Uh, we need a change in the legislature, and um, uh, I'd appreciate your vote uh, now through November 3rd. Thank you. This brings us to the close of our event. I would like to thank both of our candidates. I'd like to thank the staff of the North Metro Mayor's Association, our staff uh, operating the video equipment. And I have one request for everyone, and that is be sure you vote now through Tuesday, November 3rd. Thank you.